thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. I'm very happy to talk in front of such a large audience. Usually, um, data science meetups in Münster tend to be a little bit smaller than <laughs> Frankfurt. So yeah, I'm very happy to show you um, or to talk about one of my favorite topics at the moment. And this is um, it's called decoding the black box in the title. But here in my slides, I wrote explaining complex machine learning models. But it's basically the same idea and you already got the perfect teaser actually from Joe because he used the line package that I'm also going to um, explain and talk a little bit more in detail what line actually does and how it works and why it is useful in data science. A few short words about myself. So I'm a um, biologist by training, so I studied biology and did a um, PhD in bioinformatics mainly, and I worked as a postdoc for two years, but I already knew that I didn't really like this whole system in academia where you have to apply for new grants every year or every other year, and it's not something I was comfortable with. So like many other people, I ended up as a data scientist. And um, the main way I, I turned into a data scientist was through blogging, because when I first learned um, R in statistics, I had a lot of experience using R with traditional statistics methods like survival analysis and all these kinds of things that you do in biology. But it's not really something that most companies use with their data. I mean, machine learning, of course, is a main part. But yeah, the traditional statistics tend to be a little bit neglected, even though they are also useful. <laughs> but yeah, I got more and more interested in trying out other techniques, not just the regular biology stuff. So I learned a lot from other people's blogs. And of course, our bloggers has a collection of lots of really cool and interesting things. So I started to write my own blog because I wanted to basically give back to the community because I learned everything I, I know basically is uh, because of the community, because of people who are willing to publish their work and who are free to give out their code and explain how things work and do it all for free. So I thought it's a good way to learn myself and work on projects and have an incentive to publish these projects and write the code, get feedback on the code. And if I help other people learn some new things in the meantime, that's perfect. So I started my R blog and it's now, I think I started a little, almost two years ago and there are quite a few articles on there. So if you want to check that out, yeah, a little bit less since I started working as a data scientist. Uh, I had more time when I worked uh, at the university, but there are still a few articles there with code and a little bit bigger projects. All right, let's come to this talk tonight. So I will first give you a little bit of an overview of what you will um, hopefully learn at the end of this talk. So first I will um, talk about interpretability and um, explanations of machine learning models and in particular why is that something that we should or might be interested in. So why do we say that machine learning models are black boxes? So why do we need to explain them? Um, and why does it make sense to try and understand them a little bit better? Then I will go into um, ethics, morality and society. So very big implications, very big buzzwords. But um, they are something that is very important if we talk about lots of machine learning models that have actual implications for people. So um, trying to understand them better has direct impacts on how interpretability can help with fairness and bias in machine learning models. And if we think about the European data um, regulation that has uh, gone into effect since May, um, there's a lot of discussion about this right to explanation, does it exist, how can we implement this, and I will talk a little bit about this. And finally, I will go into the nitty gritty of how can we achieve interpretability or explanations for our models. And one of the more famous algorithms nowadays is Lime, but I will also show you a few of the older traditional um, attempts to explain how machine learning models make decisions. Um, but Lime I will talk about in detail, so I will show you how Lime works, how it makes these uh, explanations, and how you can apply Lime to text data, to tabular data, and also to image data. And talk a little bit about the new um, paper that has come out just this year from the same guys who developed Lime. It's called Anchors, and you will learn what these are at the end of my talk. All right, 
So interpretability and explanations of machine learning models, my first section. Why is that something that we even really discuss? So of course, when we talk about machine learning models, everybody who has a little bit of a different expectation, so, so what should a machine learning model do? What do we want to do? Why do we have it in the first place? So of course, there's the data scientist. I expect most of you are probably data scientists. So you will usually train your model and you want to achieve high accuracy or low error. So you optimize your model. We have a certain goal that you want to achieve with your model and you optimize it in a way so that I say the numbers that come out are as good as possible. So this is one part, but we often also are in the position that we have to sell our model so that someone comes and wants to know what happened. So what did you do with the model? And usually this is, you explain them, I used this algorithm and maybe I used these hyperparameters and this is the, I used TensorFlow, maybe this is the um, backend I used and so on. And this is usually fine for us, but there are other people who have a little bit of a different perspective on it. And then of course there's the user. The user in this case is the person who would apply or would be affected by the decisions that are made by our model. And the user, user usually wants to know why the model works in a certain way. So if you think about traditional or very classical examples like fraud detection, maybe the user wants to know why a certain transaction or person has been classified as fraud and another has not. And in the, last, the last big part is politics when we talk about data safety and data regulations and privacy and all these, these buzzwords. Politicians usually are not that well versed in the theoretical aspects behind it. They don't really understand often what happens there. But of course, they have the task to protect society from misuse and harm. So they expect to have a certain transparency in understanding what these models actually do. And, what the effect on people and the society might be. So yeah, why is interpretability being discussed? Of course, AI and machine learning algorithms are almost everywhere nowadays. They are in lots of our apps that we use on our phone. They um, decide which of our emails is spam. They maybe um, suggest replies for our emails, all these kinds of things. AI is becoming omnipresent. And um, because they are so efficient in many tasks, they tend to be yeah, better to use um, yeah, more efficient machine learning algorithm than humans who can do the same thing, but with the, the yeah, lower accuracy, for example. Data privacy and security becomes more important because people nowadays uh, realize that it could be a problem, obviously, when we talk about cloud and all these things where people are afraid that their data might end up somewhere and is being misused for something, for whatever this might be, but there is this fear that if my data is in the wrong hands, then something terrible might happen. So, um, of course, media is um, often not very positive about this and they write a lot about this, especially with the data regulation. And what goes in the same direction that AI is a little bit of a hype topic when we think about how usually media reports about AI. They either tell you how amazing it is or they tell you all the horrible things that might happen. We will end up with a brave new world and everything is either very great or, or horrible. So it's very difficult for the normal regular people to know what to believe and what machine learning models actually are and it's a little bit of magic but not really, and explaining the decisions and really going into detail what the decision that a machine learning model made can help a lot with bridging this gap. Because of course, AI is complex, right? It's not, if it were easy, it wouldn't be as good as it is, but because it is complex, we need to have additional means of explaining or at least trying to explain to the regular people who are affected by some of these models what's actually going on. So the first question that arises, of course, why is that even a problem? So why are we calling machine learning models black boxes? And the reason is very simple because we don't know actually what happens in most of these models. I mean, yeah, there are some of some models where you can 
have a little bit more um, insight into what actually happens. If you think of a decision tree, it's very simple. You can just see at each split what decision has been made, so which feature and which threshold led to um, yeah, going in one direction of the tree in, or in the other. But then you have random forest and it already gets more complicated. And when we think about very complex uh, deep neural networks, we might be able, even if we knew all the weights or if we look at all the weights that go in there and all the convolutions or whatever might happen in the background, we still wouldn't really know what this really means. So why is one decision made in a certain way? So here the typical machine learning workflow. You probably all know this. We start with data collection. We usually have to do some data cleaning and data preparation. Then we come to the fun part, the model training. We train our models. We optimize the hyperparameters. And finally, we, are, uh, we end up with a model that's for us is the best model. Maybe it has 99% accuracy. We are really happy. We go to our boss and say, here, we have the perfect model. We can deploy it now. Everything is perfect. Our, uh, our numbers say so, so here let's stop, and that's where usually we stop, right? We are happy when we have a great accuracy or we have low error, and we say now I trust my model because of course the number said so, why shouldn't I trust my model? But maybe you shouldn't be so quick to trust your model, <laughs> and I want to argue for that in a minute. But first I want to go a little bit more into detail um, what this trade-off between interpretability and complexity means in this context. So we use these usually very complex models, like let's say a neural network or a deep neural network. And we use it because it is so complex that it's able to learn really complex tasks, right? Usually tasks that for us as people are super easy, like recognizing faces in the crowd or on images or recognizing trees or cats or dogs on images is something that we can just do like this. I just look at this and I don't know why I'm, I know, but I just know that this is a face and this is not a face, right? And for a really long time, we thought that it's not possible to teach a computer to do the same thing that we do so easily, the same with um, understanding natural language. And these deep learning models, they are now able to do exactly these things and they are really, really good. So we don't really know why they are as good as they are, I mean, of course, different architectures have been tried out and they worked, but for a lot of them we just really don't know why some things work and other things don't. So they are really complex and they are really good at what they do, but they are really hard to understand. So of course, if we look at very simple things like linear regression models or logistic regression, it's very easy to understand what happens there. You have very easy um, relationships between variables, out and outcomes, it's very easy to understand. But complexity, of course, is almost impossible to understand. So why now, the big question, why should we improve our understanding of machine learning models? Or should we at all? I mean, maybe we can just say I don't care, right? But I would argue that it does make sense to look a little bit more um, into our models and try to understand them better. Because for one, it will help us to improve our models. If we know what they actually did or what features they based their decisions on, we can find out if it actually makes sense. I mean, the example that Joe brought was perfect for that. He used the Lyme algorithm to um, explain why a certain player has been classified as, like, I don't know, as good or what the class was or underappreciated, <laughs> and he could go to an expert, to Ari, and he could say, ah oh, yes, this player has been classified in this way because the feature X, Y, and Z had this, uh, this value. And yeah, based on my personal experience from years of being in the field, I know that this makes sense, so I trust the model because I can understand that the features that led to the, um, the, the, um, to the prediction they make sense to me, so I trust my model. So it's kind of a sanity check that can also prevent wrong conclusions before we put a model in production, for example. Because sometimes we, don't, we won't really recognize it at first. There are very, um, very crass examples. One of them is um, the example where they trained an image recognition model on tanks and civilian um, vehicles, and they had 
tank images on the one hand and civilian vehicles on images on the other hand and they trained their model. It was really good. It recognized the test images with, I think, 99% accuracy. They were really happy with that. And then they, I did, they didn't really bring it into production, but then they tested it with new images that came in and all of a sudden it was complete rubbish and nobody knew what happened because it was so good on the test data. And after a long time, they found out what the model actually based its predictions on wasn't the, like the object that was of interest, so the tank or the civilian vehicle, it was the background. And the reason was just this, that the, um, the training set was biased because they took the tank images, which were usually from um, Iraq and Afghanistan, so places where there's a lot of sunshine, where the background has a certain color, hue and depth, and all the civilian uh, images, they were of a broader range. A lot of them had darker backgrounds or even rain or whatever. So what the model learned was the wrong feature. And you didn't know this because you had no way to check what features were these predictions based on. And if we had something like Lime back then, we could have run this algorithm. It would have shown us that, ah, here the prediction has been made because of the background. And we as humans could intuitively understand that this is the wrong feature and we could have prevented, okay, this model did not go into production, no uh, civilian um, vehicle was shut down because of this model, but it could have been and um, it could have been prevented if we knew what happened. So what comes, of course, with this is improving trust and transparency. If we understand our models, we can trust them better and they are more transparent, we can explain them better to people and we can justify that our models are making the right decisions. And this will in the end help to prevent bias and to um, promote fairness if we think of uh, societal, um, of, of yeah, decisions that um, impact society. So here, the improving our models part with a few, few examples. Um, the first example is, for, uh, I think the first two examples are from the Lion paper. There's the link to the Lion paper in the corner. Um, they are basically very similar to the, uh, what I just explained. Just that here they tried to classify images of wolves and huskies and the same thing happened. The training set was biased. What the model actually learned was whether there's snow in the background or not. Similar with text classification of uh, um, message boards where they had Christian and atheist message boards and um, what they found out with their model is that sometimes a very accurate model can base these predictions on completely weird things like let's say the domain um, email address at gmail.com was linked somehow with atheist posts. Doesn't really make sense. We know this is not a generalizable feature but the model didn't know this because the training set represented this data in a way that led to this wrong conclusion for the model. So the same if we want to apply this to image recognition um, to our pre-trained nets like uh, Google's Inception Net, if we know which areas of, our, of the image contribute to a decision, we can know if it makes sense or not. So yeah, lack of misunderstanding obviously can lead to mistrust in our model and this is particularly relevant when we think of um, societal impact of models. So yeah, I will not go into detail in, into all these examples here, but there are lots of examples where models learned weird things because the data was somehow skewed. For example, this pneumonia example uh, here, they trained the model, they wanted to know if asthma patients or regular patients were more likely to suffer from pneumonia if they were in the hospital. And what the model found that asthma patients were somehow less likely to suffer from pneumonia if they were in the hospital. So really weird, right? Because humanly, intuitively, we would think this does not make sense. Someone who has a bad lung is more likely to suffer pneumonia. And the reason was that these patients, these asthma patients, were tended to have a higher level of um, medical supervision already. So they were more likely to go to the doctor earlier. They were under closer supervision. So they recognized these pneumonia cases earlier. And so they ended up having fewer cases of pneumonia. Something really weird, but here you can see that training machine learning models isn't always that easy to just look at metrics like accuracy or error. Sometimes you really have to understand what's actually happening with the data that goes into the model. So of course, if we talk in terms of models um, that 
are used in businesses. It's not life or death like in a medical field. But here, even here, we can save a lot of data if we catch the model doing something it's not supposed to do before we put it into production and maybe learn after weeks or months of a um, model that makes wrong decisions and costs us money. What's happening now? I don't know what that is, but all right. <laughs> okay. So identifying and preventing bias, I think there should have been a nice cover slide that introduces you the next section about uh, society, ethics and morality. Just imagine it's there. <laughs> so the first thing that is important for society, ethics and morality is identifying and preventing bias. So of course, as I just said, the data that we put into our model has a very, very strong effect on the features that are learned. So if we have a biased ground truth or biased data, our machine learning model will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So one example is credit checks, of course. So there are models that uh, will predict or will, will classify. Um, let's say you go to a bank, you want to apply for a loan because you want to buy a house and the model will put, get all your feature information that has been trained on historical data and now it will decide whether you get the loan or not. So, sorry. so what happens if it decides a certain way? If it says, no, you, you will not get a loan, you won't know why, and maybe it's based on something that's wrong. Maybe it's based on a societal bias that's in the data. Maybe, let's say, colored people were historically less likely to get a loan, not because they were actually less likely to pay back the money, but just because the societal biases prevented them from getting loans because the people who made these decisions were biased in their way of thinking. So this will now be in the data and our model will learn, yes, based on historical data, colored people were less likely to get a loan, so there must be a reason for it, and it will learn this feature and, yeah, make the prediction if you are not careful, if you are not really, if you don't think about these things before or if you don't recognize this, this might be a problem. Similar with models that help judges, I think, in California decide whether um, prisoners are um, eligible for parole or not. The same thing here. You might have societal biases in terms of race or gender or whatever, and these biases might be learned by your machine learning model without you actually realizing that you are here promoting a societal bias that's not based on real facts, but just because our ground truth is biased. And if we think of job candidate matching, here we have the same thing. If historically women were, um, there are very few women in IT jobs, let's say. I mean, here there are a bit more women than usual, but oftentimes I'm the only woman in a group of 50 people, <laughs> let's say. So if the, the historical data has such a bias in there, this might be learned, right? And if now I apply for a job and the machine learning algorithm has learned that women are less likely to be, in a, be a good fit for an IT position. I might not get a job, not because I'm not qualified enough, but simply because something else was biased. And the last very important um, argument for um, should, why should we explain our models better is this much talked about right to explanation if it exists. So yeah, I already said since May, you all probably know it, the new EU uh, general data protection regulations are being enforced. And there is uh, this EU regulation, you probably already know what it is. So supposedly strengthens the um, data protection of everybody, but it has a few very interesting passages in there. So this is actually from articles 13, 14, 15, and 22. So the main parts there, the controller shall provide the following information. So the existence of automated decision making. So this is easy. You just have to say if a machine learning model um, makes a decision that affects someone personally, you have to tell that, that this is based on a machine learning model, so on an algorithm and not by a human. But the second part is much more interesting. And meaningful information about the logic involved as well as the significance and the envisaged consequence of such proce processing for the data subject. So now I'm not a um, 
10 minutes. Oh, oh now I'm much too, too uh, slow. So yeah, we can think a lot about what does it mean? Is this really something a right to explanation? But it might be, and we might, might have to justify the decisions our models make. So now, how can we find these explanations? And we want to ma mainly answer this question. Can we trust our model with more than just accuracy or error? So interpretability is more than feature importance because feature importance is, you, you can calculate this for a lot of algorithms, like let's say a random forest. You can calculate something similar for a neural nets, even though it's a little bit tricky whether that's actually meaningful. But let's just say it's not really what interpretability means. There are a few approaches, and here's just a collection of some of the more uh, popular ones. So um, Lime and Anchors, so partial dependence plot, ice plots, Shapley values, tree surrogates, or breakdown package has a few collections. So what these are in detail, I will not, not discuss. It's just in, say that partial dependence plots basically yeah, can, in a very low dimensionality, um, show you correlations or interactions between features and the outcome. Um, Shapley values um, do something similar. They are based on game theory, but they will also give you weighted contributions of each feature set to the outcome. And the interesting thing that I want to go into detail here is Lime, because Lime is um, a very fancy algorithm and a very interesting idea behind it. So it stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations, and it has first been described in this paper, Why Should I Trust You? Explaining the Predictions of Any Classifier by Marco Ribeiro and colleagues in 2016. It has been written in Python, but it's also been adapted for R, and R is also what I'm using in the examples that I will be showing you. And I will skip over this video. It's a very nice explanation of what Lime actually does. You can look it up later. You will get the slides and everything. So how does Lime work? It basically works uh, with these three principles that I have here. The first one is that explanations are given for one instance at a time. So this means you cannot get a global explanation of what your model based its decisions on. You can only look at one instance at a time. And with this one instance, a simple model is fit to local predictions. And what this means, I will explain in the next slide. Just know that a simple model is fit, and it's fit locally. And these explanations are given with the original features, even though the actual model calculates abstractions of these features. So here is the workflow of Lime. We take our machine learning model that was trained just as you would normally. Let's say you worked with an R, you might have worked with Carrot or with H2O. You might have used AutoML from H2O, which I also use. It works very well. And you can just take your model or let's say Keras. And then you have one instance where you want to find the explanation for. You take this instance, you permute or you perturb it. So this just means you multiply it and change changes a little bit every time. And now you can have your set of perturbed samples. So they are very similar. They just have small minor changes. You can take your original machine learning model, make predictions with this model on all your perturbed data sets. Um, then you calculate how different was the perturbation compared to the original instance. And then you calculate most important variables you can read the paper to, to find out how this is done exactly. Just know that you now take these most important variables, you take the distance of your perturbed samples as weights, and you use this to fit a simple model locally. It might be a linear model or a logistic regression model or some other very simple model. And now you can use this to find the explanation. So here, this is what I already told you. You have the permutation. You have the distance and similarity. You can basically use any distance or similarity metric. The um, defaults are cosine similarity for text models. Um, Gower is now the default for the R-line package, um, for tabular data, Euclidean distance, or whatever you want. 
the most important variables. You can look that up, what this exactly means. There are different ways to calculate what are the most important variables. And you fit your simple local model, which regression is the default in the line package, but you could use any model. So you've already seen a similar plot. This is um, actually based on an AutoML model of um, chronic kidney disease. And here you see for three different patients why they were either diagnosed as chronic kidney di disease or CKD. And they, these are all predicted as CKD actually. And you can see for each uh, feature and the value that the feature had, whether it supports or contradicts the explanation, uh, the prediction. You can do a similar thing if you have uh, image classification models. Here we work with super pixels and super pixels are these groups of very similar pixels that you can see on the left side. Um, this is a Keras model that has been trained to recognize fruits from this Kaggle data set. Um, if you want to find out more details, I have the link to my blog post where I have the entire code and everything explaining how it works. But you can basically now um, have Lime tell you which of these super pixels contributed most strongly to the prediction. In this case, the upper one has been predicted as a banana, and these are the pixels that contributed to this decision, the lower one um, with the clementine in a similar way. And finally, we can also use this for text models. So here we have um, underlined the words that either support or contradict the classification that has been made. So here we have women's clothing reviews, and you have below the text snippet always which label was predicted. So one is whether they liked the clothing, zero is whether they did not like it, and um, also the explainer fit. And you can basically see why the model made the decision that it made. So of course there are also problems with Lyme. It's not perfect. The fit that I just mentioned before is often not very good. So you can see it's not close to one at all usually. So the, um, the linear weighted combinations of features means that it depends on the goodness of fit for this linearity and it does not always apply, so the coverage is not really clear. And there's a new paper out just from this year, it's called Anchors. And here they propose something a little bit different. It will not go into too much detail because of the time, just know that anchors are if then rules that are learned from this model and it also works with perturbations and you find rules and you have conditional distributions for your rules and you can now find anchors and say if this condition or this rule applies with a certain probability we will find our anchor and say this is the rule that is behind our explanation. So these are examples for it. But yeah, because of the time I will leave you with a take home message <laughs> that uh, I want to argue that we as data scientists need to make sure that our models are not going to cause harm to people or society because we are at the core of understanding what happens. We know our models really well usually. We know the data that goes in there. We spend a lot of time looking at the data, understanding the data. So if we are not the ones who take responsibility for making our models unbiased and fair, probably nobody really will. So I want to argue that with Lime and Anchor, it's very easy to take these additional steps to your traditional workflow. And that I want to say, at least for me, it's definitely worth the extra effort and time to understand my model a little bit better and to be more sure and have more trust in my model doing what it's supposed to do. All right, thank you very much. And there are a few ways you can stay in contact with me, of course, Twitter, you can look at my blog. Um, yeah, you can write me an email. Thank you very much. <laughs>